Welcome back to Vermont Judiciary Committee. We just took a short break and it is uh, Thursday, May 13th, and we are continuing our discussion on H317, uh, draft 7.1 for, for folks who are watching on YouTube. It is on our committee website and seems like everybody has it here. And Eric, actually, if you could um, just point us to the, the one change so that it, that way everybody knows what we're looking at, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, so Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel for the record, <clears throat> looking now at uh, draft 7.1 of the proposed amendment to H317, uh, the new language that uh, the chair was just referring to uh, is on page three, uh, lines three to four. So you'll see the discussion had been whether uh, it might be useful to uh, clarify that the appropriation to the attorney general's office could be used for other purposes other than contracting with the UVM internship program. And that's what that language is intended to say. So you say that the of the 15,000, uh, sorry, $50,000 appropriated to the AG, uh, starting on line three, portions of which may be used to contract with other entities for assistance. That's the new phrase right there. And with the, and then it goes on to, that's what you saw before, and with the UVM's legislative internship program. So just clarifying that um, the appropriation isn't intended to be restricted to the UVM internship program can be used for other purposes as well. Thank you. Good, good work, Eric. Ken. Sure, thanks. Why are we limiting that to, why is just the Attorney General's office making that decision? Because they're the, they're the entity that uh, oversees uh, RDAP, this, this uh, entity that is hosting and uh, organizing and conducting this study is within the Attorney General's office. So that's where they're supervised. So nobody, nobody from opposing sides or anything like that would have problems with that, Eric? I don't think so. No, I think they okay. all sort of, it's just a structural thing. Okay, thank you. You bet. Any other questions for Eric? So can I ask another one? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, absolutely. So basically all we're doing is we're covering this for right now in this if I remember correctly, is just going to appropriations and then we're going into a deeper dive when we come back next year? Yes. yes Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Sure. Nobody else? Okay. Uh, Bob. Sorry about that. Thank you. So, so just for clarification, what uh, so we're not voting whether or not to pass or not pass 317. We're just voting on those two issues for the miscellaneous judiciary bill and Senate appropriations, correct? So do you want me to put the motion out there so we know what we're voting on? Sure. Yeah, I mean, so here, here's here's what I would have as the motion and, and uh, it, it would be, uh, well, I'll move to approve for inclusion in the miscellaneous judiciary bill S97, the language in version 7.1 of H317. Is that appropriate motion? Does that work, uh, Chair? Yeah, no, I think that's I, I think that's very clear. Okay. Do you have a second? I'll second. Thank you. So discussion. So, so Bob, does that does that answer your your question? The motion through the motion. Just yeah, the motion clearly helped out. So we're not setting up goalposts here and voting on something specific as far as the bill itself is concerned. We're just voting on those the addition of the language and fifty thousand dollars along with uh, the sum stuff. Right, so we're, we're just voting on this particular language 
to go into 97, but we are not voting on the entirety of S97, if I'm if I'm understanding it correctly. Uh, I'm talking about 317. I understand. I, I think I'm good. And I'm not saying I'm for or, or not in support of 317. I'm, I'm just saying there's some, some issues in there that I'd like to discuss when this come back up to us next year. Okay. So, so. thank you. Any other discussion? Ken. So um, I, I think I heard or, or I'm under the impression that the administration was, was okay with all this, right? I mean, this was part of their, um, what they were looking for too, correct? Not the correct words, but. Um, sure, Martin, and then I'll. Yeah, uh, and that's kind of why I flagged earlier and, and, and maybe missed as far as the members uh, of, the, of the RDAP and, and the RDAP unanimously approved this on Tuesday. And they include people from throughout the administration. I could go back over that if you want, uh, but uh, well, I, I will. It's the department. Somebody from Department of Children's and Families, uh, somebody from the Vermont State Police, uh, the Department of Corrections, and then uh, the Director of uh, Racial Equity has been uh, sitting in on all of these meetings as well. Though she's not a voting member of RDAP yet, so uh, so I, I would say that the answer. Uh, is yes, uh, because those members of our DAP <clears throat> who are part of the administration all voted in favor of this. And I would just like to add that this came out of Justice Reinvestment 2, um, which certainly um, the administration is, has been very supportive of, of um, Justice Reinvestment 1 and Justice Reinvestment 2. So, does that? Does that answer your question, Ken? My computer could just cut out and I missed the whole thing. So was it there? I guess all I need to know was they know about this, right? They're part of it, right? <laughs> right. And what I'm not sure if you missed Martin's as well, but but what I, I missed every I missed everything. Everything. But okay. if they're part of it, I'm good with it. Thanks. Oh, okay. Yeah, and there's four or five members of the board that work directly for the administration or or, or the governor or whoever that um, that are on the board. And, and uh, as far, far as the whole board goes, they were unanimous in support of this. Yeah, I thought so. Thank you. Yeah, and, and what I said is that this came out of um, Justice Reinvestment 2, uh, which the administration is very much in support of and involved in. So not seeing any other hands for discussion. So I think we could just do a, um, a show of hands uh, for this. So all those in favor of, uh, oh, Tom, are you voting already or do you have a question? <laughs> yeah, I already voted. <laughs> okay. All those in favor of Martin's motion, uh, please um, by a show of hands. And all of those opposed. I think we have to wait for all hands to go down first. Uh. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And I don't think we're missing anybody, right? Okay. Wonderful. Thank thank you so thank you so much. And thank you. Eric and, and any of our witnesses that are still here. Great. Maxine, um, miscellaneous judiciary bill. Uh, we'll probably take a look at that at the beginning of next week, I would say. I think it's up for tomorrow, but I have to look. Oh, it is. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I knew think. it was going to be soon anyway. Yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I don't have the agenda right in front of me, but if it, but if not, if not tomorrow. Yes, it is. Beginning. It is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So we are now going to uh, turn our attention to S3, uh, which um, is a bill pertaining to uh, competency um, to stand trial. And if uh, folks remember, um, there were appropriations in 
in the um, in the bill for Department of Mental Health for the forensic working group and for legal aid, I believe. And um, and so I want to welcome um, Representative David Yacovani from Appropriations, who has um, who was representing the Appropriations Committee um, to report on the committee's amendment. And welcome and thank thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you, Th thank you. I'll, I'll try to be succinct here. Um, I'm told that this could come up on the floor today. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but um, just wanted to share that with you. Even though it's on the notice calendar, it may be asked to be moved forward. Um, as you may know, when this bill passed the Senate, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, who also serves on the Senate Appropriations Committee, removed the funding for the bill with the intent of putting the funding into the Appropriations Bill, H-439. And, and um, that's what they often do. Through some oversight, accidentally, the money was not appropriated. So here it is in the house, uh, a good bill um, uh, that needed some, some funding. And that's what we are, I, I'm gonna try to present to you today. And of course, I think you all know this a lot better th than I do, but we reviewed section two, which concerns court proceedings that existing law requires after a defendant in a criminal proceeding has been found to be either at insane at the time of the offense or incompetent to stand trial. A psychiatric examination is ordered by the court whenever the question of the defendant's insanitary or competency has been raised. If there is a finding of incompetency or insanity after the evaluation, then the court holds a hearing to determine whether the person is a danger to self or others. If the person is a danger, the person must be committed to either the department, the department of mental health for treatment or the department of aging and independent living if the person's incompetency or insanity is the result of a developmental delay, developmental disability. Currently, as I think, as you know, the uh, person's criminal defense counsel continues to represent the person at the hearing. In section two, uh, it now instead provides, calls for, that the defendant is entitled to have counsel appointed from Vermont Legal Aid. A defendant who would prefer to be represented by a, a private attorney can also do that. This is where we move into the appropriations because of, in part because of that action. The appropriation in the committee's amendment is necessary because section three requires legal aid to take on a new role representing criminal defendants in these commitment uh, proceedings. As a result, legal aid will need additional uh, attorney capacity to provide the representation. Additionally, because of uh, substantial experience litigating these type of cases in other contents, contexts, uh, specifically civil commitments, as opposed to cases involving uh, criminal defendants, legal aid anticipates uh, contesting more issues and challenging more court ordered psychiatric evaluations than is currently the case. This means more funds will be needed to conduct the independent psychiatric examinations that the defendants have a constitutional right to request. The Department of Mental Health will also need more resources to respond as a party in these proceedings. We've recommended appropriations there also. So the appropriations amendment which will add a new section eight to the bill, appropriates the funds for each of these purposes. First, section eight appropriates $250,000 to the Department of Mental Health to contract with Vermont Legal Aid for the purpose of providing the representation in the proceedings. 
uh, we took testimony from legal aid and the department as to the amount needed in this instance. Secondly, an additional 250,000 is appropriated to the Department of Mental Health to reimburse legal aid for the independent psychiatric evaluations that would be conducted uh, at the defendant's request and to fund cost to the department, which they'll incur as they'll appear as party in these additional proceedings. They will need more legal staff time. And finally, Section 8 appropriates $30,000 to the Department of Mental Health to, do, to uh, fund the forensic, forensic Care Working Group, which has a number of different activities they'll be undertaking. Uh, and the committee is cre created in the department to study these uh, various, excuse me, various issues that are, are related. Uh, $25,000 is appropriated to support the task group which may include staff time that's necessary. And 5,000 is appropriated for per diems and other reimbursements that may be necessary. The committee's vote on this was 11 0, zero. I hope that's uh, helpful as to why we're doing what we're doing and we request your support. Thank you, very, very helpful, very thorough presentation. Appreciate it. I do see that Tom has a <laughs> Yes. Welcome, Representative Iacovone. Greetings. Um, uh, in the Section 8, uh, 1 and 2, the two uh, $250,000 uh, amounts, um, those can only be used in, uh, um, this, this is a question, not a statement. Those can only be used in uh, competency and insanity hearings or pleas in, in other words, in, in other words, uh, uh, Department of Mental Health, or, or I'm sorry, legal aid, or uh, or whoever wouldn't be able to use those funds for anything else but those types of cases. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any hands, but any other questions or? Or comments? Um, no. Martin, as a reporter of the bill, any anything you would like to add? No, I'm just going to have uh, uh, Representative Diacovoni explain the whole bill because that was so clear. I'm going to, you know, <laughs> well, do the uh, for me. <laughs> you're, you're, you're prone to a little hyperbole. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, my, my thanks to uh, Eric for all of his uh, assistance with this and coaching me. And I, I will. Um, I'll be comfortable if I am questioned on the floor on uh, more of the content here. I'll, I'll be yielding rather quickly. <laughs> I'm happy to be yielded to. So no, thank I think you. Great. thanks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Tom, I don't know if your hand up, is your hand up from before? Or, um, yeah. Well, I would very much entertain a motion to um, treat this amendment as favorable. So moved. Yeah. Second. Second. Okay. Great. And so, Ken, why don't we do this on the on the record, please? So the clerk shall commence to call the roll. One second. Okay, uh, Christy. Christy? Yes. Colburn? Yes. Donnelly? Yes. Me? Yes. Lalon? Yes. Leffler? Yes. Norris? Yes. Knopp? Yes. 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 Rachelson? Yes. Burdick? As in Wills, uh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Why do you do that to me? Madam Chair? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so it, it sounds like 11-0, unanimous to find it favorable.
and I'm going to excuse myself. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have a great day, folks. Thank Thanks. You. you too. Thank you for all your work. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Thank yep. You. Okay, so the next thing we had up was H183, uh, an explanation by Michelle. Um, okay, I'll turn to Evan. I suspect that she's still still on the floor with this. Excuse me, with this. Uh, I just want to double check. Um, yeah, the Senate. Actually, she just came into the waiting room. Good morning, Michelle. Okay. So we are going to uh, turn now to H183, which are, was, um, is our bill regarding sexual assault. And uh, even though I understand the Senate is, maybe has just um, voted on it and Michelle can bring us up to speed, did want to have us at least understand the changes um, in the version from what the House passed to what the Senate um, is passing. So I believe on our committee page, um, there is posted, 183 is posted by the, um, as passed by the House and then as uh, recommended by the, by the Senate. So I'll give folks a minute to, to pull that up. Maxine, this is all updated language that we have. Yeah, I'll let, actually I'll let Michelle tell us where the where the process oh. is and, and, and what we have. But what I'm looking at is the as passed version of 183 and then draft 1.1 1 .1, uh, dated 429. Is that? And I'll turn to Michelle. Yes, you should have. Um two amendments from the Senate. So it just, they just did second reading and they just finished it. And so both of these amendments were accepted on the floor and passed for, um, so it'll have third reading tomorrow. So you should have the Senate Judiciary Committee strike all amendment dated the 29th. And then you should also have an individual instance of amendments starting with uh, Senator Lyons um, that addresses the council language. So you should have both of those. Okay, thank you. And then you will um, walk us through and help us understand the differences? Sure. Okay. I'm just bringing up. Um... Many members, do you have what do you, have... what you need? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you. I'm just making sure that everybody has, um, has what they need, has, have the documents in order to follow. And I'm, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing this, so. Great. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I'm going to start off with the uh, with the Senate Judiciary Amendment. And did you want me to share the screen, or do you want to follow separately? Which reference? I think follow separately, please. Okay. So uh, so section one is your definition section, um, and I think you guys are already aware they did change the definition of consent. Um, so the House proposal has had essentially left the definition as it is currently, but added the word uh, the words knowing. So it'd be uh, knowing and voluntary. And the Senate adopted this new language um, that it means the affirmative, unambiguous, and voluntary agreement to engage in a sexual act, which can be revoked at any time. Um, they spent a lot of time discussing the definition of consent in committee and um, wanted to uh, have more explicit language uh, in this definition. Um, they looked at other states, I think, as, as, as you did as well. Um, and uh, they settled on taking um, some language from Oklahoma, which is in this definition of consent. They did not make any changes to the definition. Actually, um, actually Michelle, right. before you before you continue, so when you say some language from Oklahoma, um, can you explain I can, that? I can, I can pull it up. I'd have to take a look at it and look at the differences. Um, I don't have. Here's my, 
but my understanding is correct is, you know, often we'll, we'll model something after another state and, and pretty much use most of it. Um, my understanding is that this is, this is part of Oklahoma's. I believe so. I'd have to go back and double check, but, but yes, you know, so you have your definition sections, but they all obviously work with the entire scheme of the statutes and the elements and the provisions that are in there. And so there may be certain ways that the, that the uh, statutes as a whole operate um, that aren't all necessarily contained in the definition. So like an example would be, so I think, I think your point is that it's, it's sometimes hard to compare as apples to apples. Um, you know, an example would be a lot of our consent um, detail is contained in 3254, uh, not just all in the definition section. And so, um, and so I, I, I think your point is that you sometimes when you're look, trying to look at them, it's not necessarily uh, comparable. Um, so, and I can pull up, and I think the, the Oklahoma definition, I think was um, in the document that uh, Rory shared with you uh, back when you were taking up this issue and is probably on the website under there. And if folks can't find it, I can, I can email copies. Okay, um, thank you. There were, yep. um, so there were no changes to uh, section two. Uh, so that remains the same with regard to the elements. Um, on section three, um, there were uh, a couple of changes there. So subdivision one um, in the house proposal was kind of a, a rephrasing of, of that language um, uh, that currently says lack of consent may be shown without proof. You had lack of verbal or physical resistance does not constitute consent. And that was based on what, the, what there is in Title 10 at the federal level. They just reverted back to the existing law in that particular provision. Um, then on Subdivision two in the house proposal was struck. That was an expression of lack of consent through words or conduct means there is no consent. And then they um, essentially left all of the other ones um, uh, the same and just moved that up so that what you had in subdivision three is now subdivision two. Um, sorry, I'm trying to toggle back and forth between the two versions. Um, Right, so the rest of that is the same. There's a new section four in the Senate version, and um, this is asking the Vermont uh, Sentencing Commission to look at the issue of the application of the consent uh, language in 3254 to loon lascivious conduct. Um, this is because as they were working with that and they were distinguishing well, what constitutes lewd lascivious conduct versus what constitutes prohibited conduct. You might remember a few years ago, um, there was a Vermont Supreme Court case around prohibited acts, which was kind of a catch-all offense that was used um, for sex offenses, for minor sex offenses, but it's in the prostitution subchapter um, of chapter 59 and they said it didn't apply to things that didn't involve prostitution and so you create you bifurcated it and retitled prohibited acts to be prostitution you created prohibited conduct under under the lewdness uh, subchapter and so uh, they're just asking for the sentencing commission to look at how consent plays between those those two new statutes or between the new statute and the 2601 LNL. Section five. Is, I just want to make sure committee members are are following are following that. Don't have any questions. So they didn't make any changes to the application to LNL. They just want to take a look at it. Okay. Um, section five on data collection. Um, there were no changes to that section. And then they um, have the 
the effective date still remaining on July 1st. So that's the Senate Judiciary. And then the Lyons Amendment brings in the, the council language that I can move toward. Is it okay to move over to the Lyons Amendment? Please. Yeah. So, um, so if you look at the Lyons Amendment, um, you'll see it, this brings the council back in. So as it came out of judiciary, they had taken out the, um, the council. They, uh, this was supported by Senate education unanimously as a recommendation to judiciary. Judiciary supported it, then appropriations um, supported it as well because of the appropriation there for funding for staffing the council as well as per diems and expenses. They made a few uh, changes to this and I have a, I'll just kind of hit the highlights, but I, I do have a kind of a highlighted marked up version that has all the different little things there that I can send to you if you're interested in the small language changes. But um, generally, um, if you move down, they made a, a changes to if you look at page two. And um, oh, one thing that they did throughout is it sometimes it's where it said sexual violence, they said sexual harm. Um, because when you're talking about the scope here, harm can, you know, I mean, I think the testimony from the network was that either term would work, but um, Senate Education wanted to include the word harm um, to ensure that it wasn't just talking about, I think, what we think about in terms of sexual assault, but that, you know, when we're talking about Title IX, it's much more expansive than actually that. And so they wanted to make sure that they're, looked, they're taking a wide look at these issues. So you'll see the word harm at times that is included. Um, the next change is in page two, subdivision F. You had two college students there and um, they added a third student. They didn't change the specificity with regard to the stu two students. So you would require that one have um, lived experience uh, with regard to um, sexual violence and uh, the, uh, another student from representing a campus-based racial justice organization. So that's the same. They just added one more student onto the council. Um, and you'll see that, um, uh, so. Um, next, I'm trying to think. Um, on the duties, um, they changed these a little bit. So subdivision one, C1 on uh, top of page three, um, they wanted to had them to start out by reviewing the recommendations from the task force and to develop prevention solutions to sexual harm based on those recommendations. So there were a lot of questions in Senate education about some of the things that the force had recommended and well, or, or, you know, is there an intention to act on those things like that? And so they decided basically to have the council just kind of pick up the ball where the task force left off and, and, and work on some solutions to those. Um, if you look at subdivision C4, um, this was uh, just tweaked very uh, minorly and I'd have to compare them both, but uh, UVM general counsel had uh, requested that instead of best practices, that it's it read effective practices. Um, so just a little tweaking of the language there. Everybody, uh, both committees was was fine with that. There's a new subdivision uh, five, uh, or is it five? Yeah, um, identifying campus-wide activities, publications and services that promote a campus culture of respect to support the prevention of sexual harm. So that is new language. And then subdivision six is actually something that was a specific recommendation from the task force. And so even though they're asking the task force to, I mean, the council to pick up where the task force left off, there was recommendation in there that they wanted the task force to report on earlier rather than later. Um, and so on November, by November 1st, um, they wanted them to recommend statutory protections um, to the General Assembly um, to ensure that survivors of sexual harm aren't punished for reporting an incident of sexual violence due to alcohol, drug use, or other minor conduct violations. And so kind of similar to what you just did with the Good, Good Sam law and saying, you know, want to make sure that we're encouraging students to report and that they don't fail to report because of a concern that they might get um, cited for cannabis or alcohol or something like that. 
Um, it still continues to be staffed by the network. Um, and uh, the, the uh, date is still the same for the general reporting. Um, uh, and then what you'll see on subsection F, subdivision one on the meetings is they've moved that date up. I think that the, uh, the council, I mean, was slated to meet, I think by uh, start, at least start meeting by September 15th in the house proposal. But because of the added requirement of them reporting to you on subdivision six um, by November 1st, you know, because they're only allowed to have four meetings, the concern was that maybe they could only squeeze one meeting in and that'll be kind of the organizational meeting and figuring out what they're going to be working on, things like that. So they wanted them to have the opportunity to have two meetings at least prior to being uh, to reporting to you on November 1st. So that's been just changed to July 15th. So the next change is top of page five and, um, and this is on the repeal. So on the, or the sunset um, and in the house version, it was seven years. And in the Senate version, it is four years. And then on the appropriations, the appropriations are the same as those that were in the House proposal. Um, there was a discussion about the fact of adding one more student and should that be changed and they decided not to change that at this point and they thought it was small enough that if they needed to do something, they could do something in budget adjustment. Then the effective dates, um, it's that the uh, because the council is going to be taking uh, taking effect and working on things earlier, um, that they have those going on passage, so they can get rolling as fast as possible. Thank you, thank you, Michelle. Sure. Ken. Oh, Ken, did you just call me? Sorry. No, actually, um, I was calling Ken because I see Ken's hand up, and then and then Kate. Thank you. When, um, hi, Michelle. When, when colleges are listed, does that also include universities? I mean, it's all the same thing, right? And that there's no dispute in that with anybody? No, I think everyone is represented. So you have in subdivision B1A, um, you have the Vermont State Colleges represented in A1B. Uh, or B1B, you have the University of Vermont, and then in C, you have the independent colleges. So they are all included, those three separate groups would then be appointing um, from their membership, a Title IX coordinator and a campus-based sexual harm prevention education coordinator. Gotcha, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the independent colleges, for example, would be Norwich University, Middlebury, Bennington, I'm sure I'm right. missing, but, but right. okay, thank Champlain. you. Uh, Kate and then Barbara, I think. Thanks, um, so sorry, I actually have a question back on sort of the original, the, the bill itself. Um, I'm just looking at the definition of consent and it added, uh, which can be revoked at any time. And I was just, I was just curious if I imagine there was some discussion about what that means. I was just wondering if you could help me understand that language a little more, like what does it mean to, to be revoked or what does that look like exactly? Sure. I think it's, you know, just plain language interpretation, which is that you, know, you can, you can consent to engage in a sexual act, but at, if any, if any point in time, um, you withdraw your consent and say, no, I don't want to do that or um, things like that, then consent ends at that point. So consent, just because you initially consent does not mean that there is continued consent if you express otherwise. Is that, is that okay? Does that help? Thanks. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I, I, I can look back to the language. The language of the bill more fully. Too. I'm trying to envision because part of this bill, like, is 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 tr it's trying to address some of these real life dynamics that arise where someone might begin a sexual encounter, let's say, conscious, 
and then become unconscious. Let's say they've, you know, consumed a lot of alcohol and, and at some point they pass out in the midst of, of an act, right? So would, if that person began a sexual encounter conscious and engaged, but maybe didn't want to like, w- would have set certain boundaries, but now they've passed out. Like, is there lack of consciousness or revocation of consent? I'm just trying to understand sort of like how that would be defined. Well, I think, sort of I think you, have the other well. provi- Sorry, you have the other provisions in the act that talk about somebody who's sleeping or unconscious or substantially impaired is incapable of consenting. And so, um, you know, we hadn't really talked with the practitioners about if, if you have consent and then someone actually, rather than affirmatively revoking consent, loses, you know, mid-engagement loses uh, capacity to con- to consent. Uh, we hadn't really talked about, but I think I think you're 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 covered by the language that's in 3254. Okay, thanks. That's what I was wondering about. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Any other any other questions for Michelle? So, okay, so they second reading today, third reading tomorrow. So, and the Senate have they, they've been having token sessions, right? On to just to try and think of when we might get it, right? They have to hold it over a day. So, if they had a token session on Monday, that would count as holding, and then they would send it over Tuesday, otherwise, they would send it over Wednesday. And sending over a notice, what they send it over, and and then not notice the next day when it comes over to you. When yeah, we, when we have to decide whether you know what our next right. session. Yep. So Tuesday or Wednesday is what is what you're saying. I think I can double check with the with the clerks there. I mean, I think if it's if it's let's say if there is if there is a token session then they would send it over to you on Tuesday, and then it would be on notice on Wednesday and up for action on Thursday. If they don't do a token session, then it'll be to you on Wednesday. Okay, yeah, that's helpful. Sure. Thank you. Okay, so again, I just want to understand what was what were the differences at this point and uh, we'll, take this up next week. Thank you, Michelle. Sure. Thanks so much. Okay, bye. Bye. Okay, so any, um, before I move on to just general discussion on expungement, any, anything else that folks questions about? Feedback, anything? No, nope. <laughs> okay, I'm not seeing any. So I um, I did did want to talk about expungement um, after the testimony that we that we took yesterday, and I um, I'm I'm very glad that we heard from from legal aid and from the Defender General's office, and um, the request from both legal aid and Defender General's office um, was to go back. To, it's, it's really virtually the same in both the, um, as passed by the Senate and what we were looking at, um, but it, it, it really um, moves forward the DMV language, the, the DMV and Judicial Bureau language, and that was the language that Judge Grierson uh, worked with DMV on uh, to, to get it right in the House version. I'm not saying the Senate didn't get it right, but just um, worked on it a bit more. Um, and um, and that my understanding from legal aid and the defender general's office would certainly be um, a step forward in terms of of expungements. And so that was their proposal, as well as going back to the Senate's uh, study, which is much more expansive and comprehensive than the than the study that we saw in the um, 
in the last version. Uh, I believe the Senate had the study going to the Sentencing Commission. Um, what I what I am thinking of and working with with Bryn on is um, is adopting um, those you know the sections. But in the study, um, I would like a comprehensive study, but some way also have the question of, of whether or not certain misdemeanors should be excluded. So not an assumption that they should be, but, but a consideration. And, and, I, and I think we can do both because on the one hand, we're, as the Senate said, um, expanding expungement. And my last, the last draft that I put forward was certainly um, really restricting it and pulling it back, but anyway, so that's what I'm working with Brent to see if there's some way that that we can that we can do both and sort of get as much much as possible on the table. Um, so that's that's what I'm thinking, and and again because um, because the proposal came from special legal aid who has been so um, so central to expungement. And the clinics and, and moving expungement forward, I I found that very, very compelling. So, just put that out to for folks' thoughts. I realize you don't have the language in front of you, so I'm not I'm not asking for a vote or anything. I'm just asking in, in concept. Is it how does that sound to you, um, Selena? I would I would definitely support that. Um, I think the last couple of drafts we've looked at. Um, well, I appreciate the attempt to respond to some of these last minute concerns that are coming up. Um, they, they really were getting to the point where they were, you know, sort of, sort of backtracking on what's possible under current law. And I feel like the legal aid and the defender general's um, testimony really brought that really made that very clear yesterday, not just the question of sort of, you know, eliminating expungement eligibility for a whole host of crimes that are currently eligible, but also just eliminating the stipulation factor. I had the opportunity to um, talk to legal aid a little more even after their testimony and they just made it clear, especially in the larger court dockets, you know, like Chittenden, court that with that without that ability it could really grind um expungement access to a halt and so i for those reasons i mean i would very i just want to say on record i am disappointed that we're not moving in the direction of more expungement eligibility um this session but i understand that powerful concerns have been raised and i would rather see us move forward these things without backtracking on what current law allows without a, a much deeper um, conversation than we're gonna be able to have in the next week and a half in this committee. So I support the direction you're headed here. Great, thank you. And can you talk a little bit more about the um, the docket? So the, the Judicial Bureau, that's what you're referring to in terms of Chittenden County? That I'm trying to remember what section of the bill that is. And seven. <laughs> it's section seven. Yeah. Follow it up so yeah. I can speak. Um, I have to go back another day. So I think um, Ms. O'Reilly referred to that a little bit in um, her testimony yesterday. And sorry, I'm just getting myself attuned to the actual language of the bill here. Um, so that is, uh, I apologize, just scrolling to get to the right section here. Yeah, it's- Page it's, 23. Thank you, that's-, that's, <laughs> that's <very small. laughs> it's, Yeah, it's, it's section seven in, in both. Uh, yeah. Both, yeah, has it said it, yeah. So I think, um, so I think, but this is the, I am I'm not finding the exact language in the bill quickly enough to, to, yeah. 
it up. But I think the, the idea was that now like state's attorneys can essentially do a block of expungements and not have to do like a case by case by case hearing, which has been critical to these clinics and just to be able to, to work things through. And um, the, it feels very important to people on the ground to retain that, that ability. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Tom. Yeah, I just wonder if you have any idea when we might look at that new language. So, so Bryn just sent me something on, on the study, uh, which I haven't had a chance to, uh, to look at. So, but I, I think I'd be able to get you something this afternoon. Um, much of it is, is the same if, if we were to work from, so even working on the draft from, from yesterday, it'd be, um, so sections, sections one and two, we didn't um, propose any changes to the Senate. And then it skips to, section five and the only change that we're proposing is judge Gerson's language regarding notify the person by electronic means as opposed to a phone call yep. and then section seven is the the dmv um judicial bureau language that that i'm understanding is, is so important to to legal aid and um, and then we, that's where we also added the, um, the exception for research entities that, that Bryn said is, is really clarifying language, but was asked for by, let me get this wrong, um, uh, CRG, right? Crime Research Group, Karen Gannett and, and Robin Joy. And then the thing that, um, and then what I'm working on now is going back to the Senate's language um, for a more expansive study, but then also trying to keep the misdemeanor crimes on the table and, and having justice oversight, not the sentencing commission uh, review this, which I believe the defender general's office testified um, a preference for that as well. Because justice oversight did the first one and this will be a different ed entity to do it right by the way around sentencing commission so, so what the um the senate passed version was a result of the sentencing commission okay and and you would like to see justice oversight do do it this time right yeah yes. okay Okay, so the new language is, is basically sections one, two, five, seven, and eight. One, two, right, one, two, five, <laughs> seven, seven, and eight. Yeah. And so really the, the the new line the new language is really going to be the study. Right, right. There because everything else we've we've seen and really have not really have not changed much at all from the Senate version. Right. So so what kind of if any at all, input would the administration have in, in, a, in looking at a study or, or maybe uh, recommendations from the study? And, and the reason I'm, I'm saying that is um, when, when, they were, when they were in, I think it was yesterday. Was it yesterday they were in? Okay, everything running together. Um, when I saw them on the agenda originally, and I think I sent this to you in a text, Maxine, um, the last time they were in before yesterday, they had, uh, the way I looked at it, they, they kind of drew, drew a line in the sand for us. And gosh, I, I think we met every, every one of their wants and needs. Um, I mean, I even went to bat with you, Maxine, on, in a telephone call for, for the meth. Um, you know, uh, and I'm just going by, we, we want to do everything we can to prevent that from grabbing hold of our state. And so when I saw there, 
they were coming back in on the witness list. I thought they were coming back in to, at the very least, not oppose and maybe even support what we did because we gave them everything that they wanted. And, and, and then they, I mean, they moved the line. You know, that's the only way I can say it, is they moved the line and uh, um, without any real, ex, any real explanations, um, uh, um, you know, Kate asked a question about what rational was and, uh, you know, a rational plan was and, and, and got zero answers um, uh, because there wasn't an answer. There wasn't a plan. And, and, and then the, the term antiquated system was thrown around without any real uh, uh, remedies to an antiquated system. And, and I, I was really frustrated um with 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 what happened yesterday i i, I um I, again i i feel that we, we we came to a place uh um you know that w there was a lot of compromise uh and 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 if, if it was something they agreed with you know i, I thought that they would have been compromising you know uh some things too but that didn't happen and um anyway i i guess uh, well, I guess we'll go back to another study, you know, and, and get some more, get some more information and more answers and, um, you know, and hopefully uh, next year, um, that doesn't happen. You know, I, I don't think it was fair to anybody the way that it all played out. I really don't, um, you know, but that's just my two cents on it and, and uh, certainly look at the new language. Thank you, Tom. I very much appreciate your, your remarks. It, it was very, very frustrating and, and disappointing. Um, I thought it was a particularly rough, rough hearing yesterday. Um, other, uh, Ken. I think, um, um, I think a lot of it is just, uh, Maybe I'm naive to it. But I think it's just trying to clear, get clarity of clarification of what really is going on. And I think uh, people really struggled yesterday with trying to get their points across. And um, sorry about that. Uh, um, I just think it was a bad day and it was a bad presentation. However, I think uh, Commissioner Sherling uh, made uh, got some light on that, and hopefully, uh, going forward, we'll get more uh, more clarification. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any anybody else? Yes. So when we when we adjourn now, I will um, work with Bryn on the on the language, and then I, I think she should be able to send everybody at least by email a um, a new draft, and then we can um, and then we can take a look at it. Will be posted on our page also. Yes. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, did yes. did did we do a straw on uh, three seventeen? Yes. Uh, if if it was a formal vote, was it a formal or a straw? It was a straw. Okay. It was, it was a show. It was. A, I think it was a show of hands, right? I'm getting confused with that. Yeah, that was a show of hands, and three was a formal. Okay. Uh, because I uh, obviously would have uh, voted in favor. Uh, just had a had to get some things squared away for. Uh, when uh, Mary gets back. That's why I had the mask and stuff and got back a little late there. So thank you. Yeah. We were going to start calling you Dr. Christie. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was trying to cover up that he might have shaved. <laughs> <laughs> Is she home now, Coach? That, that's what went through my mind. Is she was home, so you were wearing the mask. Uh, not, not yet. Uh, oh, okay. Still trying to get things um, 
situated. Uh, yeah. Actually, it was a contractor. Uh, we've got some potential trip hazards, you yeah. know, sill, sill plates around and stuff. Oh, yeah. But, uh, uh, because with that uh, mobility piece on the on the right side, um, figured anything that we can do to eliminate potential problems, you know, sure. you need to get it done. Good. Okay. And the uh, the only other thing, and I, I realize this wasn't on the agenda, but um, H one forty five. I think most of you have heard that the governor um, sent a letter expressing concern about the justifiable homicide section of the bill and questioned whether or not it was the in our intent to limit or change one's common law um, right to self self defense, and uh, apparently the governor had had heard from a number. Of folks, um, there was an alert sent out by VT Guns um, expressing concern, specifically um, pointing to me and calling it calling it my bill. <laughs> um, and so, Senate Judiciary met, discussed it. Um, Martin and I were involved. Uh, Jennifer Morrison of DPS were involved with um, with a response. We're talking about a response um, because the governor has until midnight today to what to make a decision on 145, and um, wrote a letter in response that is posted on our website. Actually, both letters um, were posted yesterday. Letter from the governor, and then um, response a letter that was signed by Senator Sears um, and myself, stating that the that the intent was never to limit um, one's right to self. Defense and that the that the bill 145, the effect of it does not limit. So so it was never the intent, and it certainly is not the effect. And the lettering um, includes some case law, and Bryn was also um, involved in the meetings. So just wanted to, Tom, I see your hand up, and oh yeah, and no, I was just wondering on that, Maxine, if um, th there hasn't been a, uh, a letter from the administration. Uh, another one except the original concern or, or any uh... correct that not not yeah not not that i know not that i know but in response to our in response to our letter right right so say if they didn't accept the letter as being good enough i guess you could say would we then uh do uh an amendment or put something in in the miscellaneous bill to to satisfy their um uh questions so i don't i don't know i think it would depend upon what the what the governor would do his right. choices are to sign it to let it go into law or to veto it so but I, I think we would need to uh, martin go ahead yeah, I mean, I think it's bad precedent to put in amendments to explain what a bill doesn't do. You know, I mean, it, it's pretty clear that the right, it's not just right to self-defense, but right to defense of others uh, was part of the concern. And it's just very clear from uh, legislative council that this does not impact what current law already is. Uh, to actually have to come out and amend something to say, yeah, well, really, we didn't change these other things. I just think it's a bad precedent. I really do. Uh, you know, so. Right. I, I don't disagree, but if he's, if he, uh, if he says he's going to veto it because the, the explanation isn't good enough. And we had talked about some kind of possibly an amendment be before the letter. Um, maybe it should still be on the table, I guess. Um, hopefully, I mean, I, I read the letter and, and uh, I mean, I, I you know, it covers it as far as I'm concerned that, you know, the, the intent or what the intent wasn't, I guess you could say, um, but whether they'll accept it or not, I, I, just so uh, maybe something that deserves a tiny bit of thought just in case. Yeah. And I guess uh, just two other quick things on that is, uh, first of all, 
it, it would take two bodies to get that through. And it was pretty clear from the discussion yesterday in Senate that they would have no interest whatsoever in approaching that. And Chair Grad brought that up. Uh, okay. and soundly rejected by our sister body or brother body. Yep. The, the, the other thing is that 145 is primarily to, to help the administration. Yeah, you know, I mean, all the other things in 145, uh, we put in there really at the request of, of uh, DPS and really work hard with them to get to that point. So if they oh, want to- Oh, no doubt there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if they want to veto this bill, because of that, particularly since we haven't changed anything and we've, we've gone an extra step already, which we never, I don't think we very seldom do. So that, that's where I am. I, I, I just don't want to leave anything out there that suggests that we sh we're going to start having a precedent of explaining what we haven't done whenever we pass a bill. So that, that's, that's just where I am. You know, that's just yeah. one of them. Yeah, thank you. So I, I think it's a matter of wait Wait and see what yeah. happens. Uh, Ken. So just to be fair here to all parties concerned, it wasn't this body that made the change. We did everything. It was the other body that, that did this. So we did what the administration, the administration was happy with us. It was the other body. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so we'll put that aside for now, unless there are any other questions. The other thing I see, um, an email from Barbara. Um, so I did, late last night, sent, um, sent a, an email to, um, to Chair Hooper regarding appropriations and I need to send it to Evan to post um, so everybody everybody can see that. and. Uh, it was it was late, so sorry, Barbara, that I didn't. <laughs> I should have copied you and represented Squirrel, but at that point, I I wanted to make sure that that appropriations got it. So I will do that. Martin, uh, separate issue. Um, do you need me to do anything with three seventeen with uh, appropriations, or are you going to take care of uh, making sure that they're aware of what we did this morning and it's ready for their consideration? I would assume it would be more of a chair to chair thing, but if you have something for me to do, just let me know. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much. Oh uh, yeah, um, I will send it. I will send it on. So. 